For the past few months, I've been building a three-piece $30,000 furniture set for a client. He loved this hall table, hated this coffee table, and in this video, I'm building the centerpiece, a nine and a half foot dining table that needs to be so good that it blows him away all on its own and ties the three pieces together in a way that convinces him this was the way to go all along. So let me start by saying I'm a people pleaser. At the end of the day, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that a client is happy. Now, on the coffee table that Scott didn't like, he actually loved everything from here down. He just didn't like the top. And obviously, taste is subjective, so what one person loves, another person might not, and there's nothing I can really do about that. But what I'm hoping is that by the end of this video, I'll be able to convince him, and hopefully some of you, that this was the right choice. So... We're kind of stumbling out of the gates here in terms of the slabs. Now, don't get me wrong, they're beautiful. Claro Walnut, which I still think makes for the best looking tabletop that you can get. But I'm struggling to figure out how to position the pieces for the top. So I think a good general rule of thumb is that the best tabletops are gonna come from a single large slab, which means that the top is gonna be smaller than the slab. However, here what I'm trying to do is make a bigger top out of two slightly smaller slabs. And I've seen a lot of people do this with some pretty bad outcomes, so I really want to avoid that. Now, the reason that I'm doing that here, and why I think most people do, is cost. The finished top's gonna be about 112 inches long and 40 inches wide, and a single slab that can give you a top that size typically costs about double the price of these two combined. Anyway, clearly I needed a second opinion here, so, Enter Dolores. Hi. This slab, 180, so that both tails kind of match. And I don't know if she's messing with me or just trying to give me a workout, but here's where we landed. There's no one big chunk that you can cut from this that's going to solve the problem of them veering away from each other. And at this point, I was getting pretty tired of moving things around, so I decided to get a picture that I could throw into Photoshop to try figuring things out digitally instead. I've been playing with this for a while now, and I feel like I'm basically just spinning my wheels at this point. So if I leave the slabs as two big pieces, there's basically only, I think, eight different combinations that are possible, and none of them are gonna close up that gap. So the other idea is to essentially cut one of the slabs in chunks. Every time I try to do that here though, I keep getting these man-made cuts that are gonna be on the tabletop, which is gonna look like horse in my opinion, so not gonna do that. We'll get it figured out, we'll do something. So I think my best solution here is to have a primary slab and a secondary slab. And the goal will be to carve the live edge of the primary into the secondary, like you see me doing here in Photoshop. Now, doing this in theory and actually doing it are two very different things. And as always, there's going to be a few obstacles. First of which is that my secondary slab is really, really bent. Thankfully here, it's still about two and a half inches thick and the finished top only needs to be an inch and a half thick. And also I know that about half of the slab won't make it into the final table. And by splitting it lengthwise right now, I can actually get rid of a lot of the warping. Now, I'm not sure if this makes sense to you, but with wood, there's four kinds of bends. Bowing, cupping, crooking, and twisting. Technically, there's also a kink, but depending on how you like yours, all four could fall under that category. Anyway, if you have cupping or twisting, splitting a piece in half lengthwise will fix a lot of the problem. So before doing anything else, I made that cut. And then I'm gonna load everything up and haul it off to my buddies at Street Tree Revival to see if this thing's gonna be salvageable. So even after making that split, you can see that the slab is still pretty twisted. But this guy right here literally saved this project and saved me thousands. And what I mean by that is, if a person took a really lazy approach to flattening a slab like this, they would have to remove so much material that it would end up being like an inch thick by the time they were done. But if they're strategic about it, they can preserve a lot of the thickness. Which is exactly what Danny did and why he's got a $20 Applebee's gift card headed his way. Thanks, Danny. 
Okay, so that's the first problem solved. And now we need to do the whole carving scribing thing. So if you look at a walnut slab, it's got the light part and the dark part. Those are the technical scientific names. And what I'm gonna to try to do is cut a line that follows the light part. So I'll start by marking that out in chalk and then taking another picture that I can get into Illustrator to create a file that I can cut on my CNC. So I found that the best approach was to start outside of the line, adjusting as I go, instead of trying to get it perfect in one cut. And the eventual goal was to keep as much of the light part as possible, but to completely get rid of any of the part that goes back in. And again, I apologize for all these technical terms. A couple months ago, thanks to many of you, the channel hit a million subscribers. And I just wanted to take a second to show my appreciation. I think it's pretty safe to say that I literally could not have done this without you. So to everybody watching this right now, thank you. Seriously. Now, chances of me ever hitting 10 million are pretty slim, let's be honest. But if you want to see if we can do it, or just give the video a like, that'll help too. But regardless, again, thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and glue the two slabs together, but they're actually still different thicknesses at this point. That said, I think it's going to be easier to get them evened out after things are dry. So you can see here, I've got some big beefy pieces of walnut that I bought online from Woodworker Source. And you would think that building with thicker pieces would make things a little harder, but it actually makes things quite a bit harder. Or... Maybe not harder, but more time consuming. But you know what? That's my problem, not yours. So we're just gonna fly right through this part. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody showed me the raw material I'm using for this table, I'd probably imagine a kind of bulky, rustic dining table. But as you probably already know, we're going for pretty much the exact opposite here sleek and modern. And in fact, one of the reasons that I was so particular about the top is because of some of the feedback that I got on this desk that I built about a year ago. Overall, people liked it, but the one critique I kept hearing was that they felt like the top and the base didn't really match. And I don't totally disagree with that. Now, I could argue that for some people, that might be the exact reason that they love the desk. But like I said earlier, taste is subjective can't please all the people all the time. But what I'm going to go for on this one is cohesiveness. I want the top and the base to feel like they belong together. And you already have a rough idea of what the top is going to look like. So let me tell you about the base. Kind of like that desk, we're going for very angular, modern, tapered, splayed legs. And I'm also going to put this detail on the stretcher that holds the top above the base so that it kind of looks like it's floating. And this is always one of those details that sounds cool in theory, but then in reality, you have to basically get down on your hands and knees to see it. So I talked to Scott about that, and he assures me that his house has a nice far away view of the table so that it won't all be for nothing. Okay, back to explaining the struggle of having really thick wood. Story of my life. So what I'm doing here is setting up a sled to cut these joint faces on my pieces. And by far the nicest cut you can get is off of a table saw. But of course, here we have the problem of the blade not being able to reach up high enough. So I tried a little experiment. My first idea was to cut as high as I could on the table saw and then use my miter saw to finish it off, which would leave this little ledge that I could clean up with a router. And you might be thinking, why not just cut the entire thing on the miter saw? Then you'll have no ledge which is true, but honestly, mine just doesn't give me a good cut. So next I tried swapping the order and made the first cut on the miter saw and then used my table saw to clean up the face. And this seemed like the way to go because it was easier to leave a really small ledge. Now, the reason that you want that small ledge is because the less material you can leave for the router, the cleaner this cut's gonna be. So that's why I was overthinking this. I've noticed that a lot of people like to knock the YouTube comment section, but I have to admit, I actually kind of enjoy them. Even the quote unquote mean ones.
If I'm being honest, my only gripe would be that each video will always have a few recurring questions that I never could have predicted. And instead of having to reply to each one individually, I'm gonna try something new. I'm gonna pin a comment to act like sort of an FAQ where I can thoughtfully respond to people. So I'm not sure if people will use it or read it, but I figure it can't hurt, so worth a shot. All right, I feel like I've been putting this off long enough, so here it goes. This table will be the focal point of a damn expensive three-piece package of furniture. So it is extremely important that it ties the whole package together in a way where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Now, I believe that it will, but the more important thing is that Scott thinks it does. So how do I do that? First, bribery. He had also asked about me making him a quick little sofa table, so that's getting thrown in. No extra charge. Okay, with that out of the way, I wanted to wait until we were far enough into the video to talk about this so that you'd have an idea of what the table was going to look like. That way it would make more sense when I say this. I hate matchy-matchy furniture. And what I really want to avoid is each one looking like a literal translation of the other two. So rather than thinking about each of these pieces in a vacuum, I tried to think about them as a series. In other words, if one of Scott's house guests were to see all three, each one would have something new and surprising about it. Now, if you look at their shapes, you can definitely see some commonalities. Obviously, the overall leg shape, but also the way that these two have a floating top. But I still think that they're distinct enough. And as for the tops, well, each heavily features a Claro walnut slab, and each features it in a unique way. The hall table is pretty straightforward. I just resawed a chunk so that you have two pieces that sort of mirror one another, and then there's a big section of epoxy down the middle. For the coffee table, we've got a panel of white oak and a particularly wavy chunk of walnut joined to it, and hardly any epoxy. And then there's this one. Now, which is best? None. I don't know. The point is, everybody's going to think something different. If you ask me personally, I like this one best. But my point is... Best is irrelevant here, because regardless of which single top is anybody's favorite, as a set, I'd way rather have all three than three versions of any one. I hope that makes sense. And like I told Scott, end of the day, if he doesn't like the pieces for any reason, I will take full responsibility for that and I'll eat the costs and figure out what to do with the pieces. So yeah, these might be for sale on my website. We'll see what he thinks by the end of the video. Now, you might have noticed that I never built a form for pouring my epoxy. And there's a lot of benefits to pouring your epoxy this way. One, and this is pretty obvious, is that you don't have to spend time building a form. And because of that, you don't have to spend time demolding a form. And actually, I guess those are kind of the only two. And also, there's actually some downsides. The biggest is that you end up relying on caulking a lot more which means that you end up cleaning up caulking a lot more. That said, maybe you're the type of person who enjoys that. I don't mind it. In full disclosure, though, I also enjoy picking lint from my belly button and those videos where somebody gets like their ears super deep cleaned. So I don't know, take that for what it's worth. Now, something else that I love that's probably a bit more mainstream is designing things. And about 10 months ago, I started designing a mechanical pencil. And I know I've mentioned it here before, but I never really got into what it was like to prototype. And it's a process. So I would say it was about four months in before we made the first prototypes. And it's definitely exciting to get the first one in hand. But I kind of felt like the only thing I could focus on were the flaws. The tip geometry was off. This gap felt too big. So I went completely back to the drawing board, threw out every dimension and started again. And another few months later, the Brass Chunky was born. Well, one Brass Chunky at least. And then from there it was on to figuring out how to produce and ultimately sell these things. Now I would say that each of these three things is equally important, but I think this one is actually the easiest thanks to tools like Shopify. And they aren't just the sponsor of this video, they are legitimately the all-in-one commerce platform that I picked to manage and grow my business several months ago way before they reached out to me. Now I know one pencil hardly feels like a business, but for me, this is a start. 
I want to eventually have a whole catalog of products that share the same sentiment as the Brass Chunky, which is one of the reasons that picking the right platform from the start was so important to me. Shopify provides all the tools you need right from the start, allowing you to sell online, in person, and across all major social media platforms. And they also have everything you need for the long haul, like analytics and marketing tools to help you grow and scale your business. So I know this might not be applicable to a lot of you because you're not trying to sell anything, but someday you might, or maybe you know somebody who is, or you are somebody who already has a business. So whoever you are, I cannot wholeheartedly recommend Shopify enough. Like I said, it's the e-commerce platform I chose on my own and the one that I will continue to use as I grow from an idea to a full-fledged business. So check them out at shopify.com slash four eyes to start a free trial. Thanks, Shopify. Next, I need to make five of these stretcher pieces. And every time I make anything where I use templates to do my shaping, I always get the same question. Basically, why not just use a CNC? And my answer is always that, first, it would be kind of boring to watch. And second, I'm really bad at it. But I figured I'd give myself a try to hopefully prove myself wrong. But I proved myself right. Actually, some better clamps fixed this problem, so I was close this time. But regardless of how I did it here, I was still going to have to finish the shaping manually because these pieces are, again, way too thick, this time for a router bit, to be able to cut all the way through. Now, one of those questions that I kept getting after the last video was basically some iteration of, what the hell is this thing? Referring to this thing. And I won't bury the lead. It turns out it's called a stacker or a pallet stacker. And I stumbled upon it a couple months back when I was trying to solve a problem, which is that about 75% of the time I'm here working, I'm by myself. And despite some of you thinking I'm like 12 years old, I'm actually 43. And well, long story short, I didn't want a forklift and a pallet jack doesn't go high enough. So I literally Googled manual powered mix between a forklift and a pallet jack. And this thing popped up and almost immediately purchased it. It was like a must have. Now the only question is, what should I name it? I'm thinking maybe Sean. Honestly though, you just saw the price, it was not cheap. And I have no affiliation with trying to sell these things, but having it has been a dream. Now, getting back to this table, one of my absolute worst nightmares is to build a piece, ship it off, and then have it fall apart because it's in a climate that I'm not familiar with and now it's thousands of miles away. Now, if you have no idea why that would be something I stress about, you might not realize that wood moves, mainly this way, across its width. And they actually have online calculators that'll tell you how much it will move. I'll put a link to the one that I used, which is on Jonathan Katzmoses' site. But it says a tabletop this size in Denver would change by about 0.18 inches over the course of a year. And the way we're going to deal with this is by attaching the base to the tabletop with some bolts that'll go through some oversized holes so that things can move without breaking apart. And I'm actually really happy that I looked this up because before I'd assumed that things would be moving more and I was going to do some slots rather than just the oversized holes. But realistically, these holes are going to leave plenty of room for movement. Plus, we're not actually worried about movement across the entire top, really only between the furthest apart bolts. Now, all of that said, the thing that I'm actually worried the most about is making sure that this tabletop is gonna stay nice and flat for the next 100 years or so. But I'm putting my faith in all of these stretcher pieces, and then for a little extra reinforcement on the ends here, some metal C channel. So I actually needed to buy some more, and I found out that a company called Semi-Exact makes C channel in a bunch of colors, and this was kind of a weird and timely discovery. So a couple months ago when I surprised my parents with a new table, I inherited their old table. And it's rare that I need a table, but right now I actually do need one for my backyard. But I know that this base would get beat to hell outside. And here's where it all comes full circle. So that company Semi-Exact that had made the C-Channel, I had actually worked with them a few years ago to design these modular metal table legs, which aesthetically are kind of like a DIY version of the base that I'm building in this video. So I ordered a set and within about 30 minutes, the kids and I had built a table. You did it. Perfect. 
Now, if we keep this thing in the sun, it's hard to say how long it'll last. But what I do know is the memories we built in those 30 minutes will last a lifetime. Hey, I said knock it off. What? Go to your room. I get asked for advice quite a bit from people who are new to woodworking. And one of my go-to pieces of advice has always been build big things. And that's because whenever people are new, they always want to build small, simple projects. You know, cutting boards, a box with a lid, maybe a birdhouse. But I've always thought that doing that was only half right. Simple? Yes, 100%. If you're just starting, keep it simple. But small? I kind of disagree. So I think that people do this because they're worried about making a mistake and ruining an entire project. And obviously they'd rather ruin something small than something big. The thing is, it's very rare that a mistake is gonna ruin a project. Usually what happens is there's just gonna be a small error here or there. You know, like a gap in a joint that's bigger than you would want. And the reality is, that small gap on a tiny fancy box might look catastrophic, but that small gap on a large bookshelf would be pretty much unnoticeable. Now, the reason that I bring this up is because this project has kind of made me reconsider that advice. Or, at least I think I need to amend it. So maybe build big things within reason. No, I know. Build medium-sized things. That's my new go-to. So if you want to build that birdhouse, don't build it for a hummingbird, but also don't build it for an ostrich. Build it for a crow. That's a sweet spot. I want to quickly shout out a couple projects that have started rolling in for the Rockler Try That Challenge that have caught my eye. So in no particular order, Branch and Bead built this conceptually simple but still very unique and striking table made completely from hexagon pieces. File 0.jpg made a timbre door that I'm pretty sure I know how it works, but still kind of bent my mind when I first saw it. And James Waugh III built this really crazy looking chair that you would think would break apart, but he... Oh, well, he still has till the end of the year to fix it. Good luck, everybody. So you can see here, we're getting down to it. And I guess this is the moment of truth. The table's built and it's time to see what the clients think. So as you already know, I've got a lot riding on this one. But while we wait for a response, let me say this. We've all heard that saying, the customer is always right. And that's a dumb saying. In fact, I would bet that statistically the customer's batting average is way below 500. Now I know that's not actually what the saying means. It means that their opinion is always right. But even taken that way, I still think it really depends on your profession. If you're a waiter, yeah, most of the time, unfortunately for you, the customer is always right. But if you're a, I don't know, an x-ray technician, the customer's opinion is pretty much meaningless. And I would say that being a custom furniture maker, you fall somewhere right in the middle. Obviously, the customer's opinion matters. It's their home, it's their vision, and it's their money. And at the end of the day, any good furniture maker should be able to give their client exactly what they've asked for. But a great furniture maker should have the confidence and the ability to give them something they couldn't even dream of. And I might not be there yet, but I'm trying. Thanks for watching.